In this video, I'm going to show the design, construction, and testing of a homemade Yagi antenna for TV reception. And specifically, I'm cutting this antenna for one frequency, channel 19, uh, to try and help out reception with a particular channel in my area. And to design the antenna, I use this software. This is called 4NEC2, 4NEC2. And this is roughly what a Yagi antenna looks like. Um, the actual structure, the boom of the antenna isn't shown. It's just you model the individual wires. And on a, a Yagi antenna, so all these wires up front here, these are called directors. And this one, in the, this one right here with the loop, this is the uh, feed point. Um, on the, it's a folded dipole. And then you have one reflector. And basically what happens is, so right out here in the x-axis, the signal comes from this direction, and all of these directors, you could basically think of them as focusing the RF energy onto this one right here. This is the only one that's actually connected to the wire that runs to your TV. And so these up here in front, they basically they are positioned and sized just so they focus the energy on this one right here. Then the reflector here kind of twofold. One, some energy that has passed is hits the reflector and is reflected back onto here. And secondly, it helps to block signal coming from behind the antenna. So this is overall design. Um, in general, the directors get narrower or shorter as you go further away. Um, also, the spacing increases as you go. Now, down below, I'll include a link to a page where you can actually download the model for this antenna if you want to play with it using 4NEC2. Um, you could also even build one yourself. Again, this is specifically cut for channel 19, so bear that in mind. Um, as for performance of this antenna, so here is what the predicted output of the antenna will be. Um, there are two lines here, so this, these are the gain using this axis over here. The gray line on top is the raw gain, which is the theoretical maximum that the antenna will do at a given frequency. The black line is the net gain, and with antennas at certain frequencies, there'll be losses in the antenna, and this accounts for it. So the black line is really the important one. That's what the predicted real-life gain of the antenna will be. And so you can see here, the gain increases, increases, and then right here is where going to channel 19 will be. And you can see very quickly it drops off. And there is one more line down here. Um, and this one is called the SWR curve. And it uses this axis over here. And SWR, I'm not going to go into what it means, but basically you want it as low as possible, the lowest value being 1. And so you can see here, SWR curve is very low, 1.1, 1.2, and then it takes a sharp dive up at about the point where channel 19 is. So this is what the predicted um, gain in SWR curves will be for the antenna. And it's clearly designed for one channel, and then it just results, especially after that frequency, are not so good. To construct the antenna, I'll be using these raw materials. Um, we've got all aluminum and some plastic, um, so we've got some one inch by one inch aluminum tubing, and this will be used for all of the structure of the antenna, and then we've got some aluminum, aluminum rods, which will be the actual elements of the antenna. And the aluminum itself, I feel it's pretty easy to get a hold of and relatively uh, inexpensive. Um, most of this stuff, if you go to like Home Depot or Lowe's, most of them have a small section in the hardware department where they carry certain sizes of aluminum stock like this. And so, for example, like this eight foot long piece of aluminum here was at like $15, which this is more than enough than I'll need for the antenna. So, you know, it's actually less than that cost wise. But um, most Home Depots and Lowe's will carry something like this. If they don't, uh, if you live in a medium to large size city, most uh, of the times they'll have a, a steel supply shop 
that sells structural steel for buildings and projects and whatnot. And most, but not all, steel supply stores will carry limited aluminum stock. So you can check places like that. And if you have a hard time finding it anywhere, you can always go online. Uh, some of these longer, uh, thin aluminum pieces, these came from onlinemetals.com and they were pretty cheap. I mean, these are six feet long at an eighth of an inch diameter and these were, I think, $1.70 each. So pretty cheap. So all in all, the, the aluminum for this antenna is going to run probably $20, $30, not that much, especially when you consider a commercial antenna usually costs $50, $60, $80 or more. So, you know, you, you still have a savings even by using high quality materials. And then the next part here for the insulating part, so this is a sheet of raw plastic. Um, this here is called very high density or very high molecular weight um, nylon, it's a VHMW. And the, the previous antenna I constructed, I actually used something called ultra high molecular weight UHMW nylon. And either way, it's basically, it's a very dense nylon or dense plastic that is, obviously it's plastic so it doesn't conduct electricity. It's easy to cut, easy to drill, easy to machine, and it's also very resistant to uh, like temperature and weather and whatnot. So it makes a great plastic for use outside. Now this particular one is one inch by three quarters of an inch by three feet long. And this stuff can be a little more expensive. This is probably actually the most expensive part of the antenna. Um, I had to get this online from a place called TAP Plastics, T-A-P Plastics. And this one piece here I believe was $15. Uh, if you have a really good like hobby supply store in your area, you might be able to find this, but I've never found it in a store. Pretty much got to get it online. Um, I would have gone with the ultra high molecular weight plastic that I used last time, but I had a hard time finding it at a reasonable price, so I went with the very high molecular weight. So um, we'll see how that works out compared to the previous antenna. And then the last bit of hardware is just various bits of uh, stainless steel screws to assemble it all together, screws, nuts, and washers. So this is the raw materials, and next is to measure, cut, drill, and assemble it all together. Here briefly is how I drill through metal. So first off, I have a drill press, which makes this a lot easier. You could do it with a hand drill, but it would be a lot easier if you have access to a drill press. Uh, secondly, always secure your work to the table. Don't try and hold metal when you're drilling it. You can do that with wood sometimes, but with metal you don't want to do it. If you've never drilled through metal, when the drill bit gets close to going through the metal, a lot of times it'll grab it, and sometimes it'll start spinning the metal on the drill bit, which could cut your fingers easily. Uh, so definitely secure it to the table. And then when you're drilling through metal, and now aluminum's a lot softer than steel or a lot of other metals, so it's pretty easy to go through, but you still want some sort of lubrication. They sell specialized uh, lubricates for this, but I just use a Q-tip with some vegetable oil on it and just put a drop on there like that. And then as you drill the vegetable oil, it'll do two things. It'll one, lubricate the drill bit, and two, it'll also help pull heat away to keep it from getting too hot. So, now as you're drilling, you wanna go slow. There's, there's no reward for getting it done quickly. And then you wanna back it out occasionally to get the shavings off and also keep it from getting too warm. And there we go. So the other thing I should mention, when you're drilling metal, whether you're doing using a drill press or a hand drill, you want to do it on the slowest speed you can. You don't want to go fast, that's just going to generate heat, which is just going to destroy your drill bit up here. So go nice and slow. So I'm at the point where I'm ready for assembly. So the boom has been cut to length, and then I've drilled holes and tapped them 
for screws along here for where the elements will be attached. And I also drilled holes here for a U-bolt to mount it to a pole. I've got all of the directors cut to length as well as the reflector and then the folded dipole here. The trickiest part with this is obviously getting a, a perfect bend right there and to do this I ended up cutting a one and a half inch circle which was about the diameter I needed and screwed it onto a board and then um, use this clamp to hold this tight and then use a piece of metal to bend it around the curve and with a little persistence you can get it pretty good as far as attaching everything so the plastic block I cut you know into little blocks like this and then drilled and recessed a hole to mount to the boom and then a smaller hole across like that and I'll pound the element through like that and it's the perfect diameter friction will hold it in place just like that as for the folded dipole, so this is a, it was a block that ended up getting cut a little shorter. So I drilled a hole across and then I cut right through the center of that hole. So it kind of left me a trough, if you will. And drilled and recessed a hole here. And then these are the two holes where um, on the back side it's recessed again. And the, the bolts will come through to this side and that's where the ballon will attach. And then the last bits of random hardware, the stainless steel screws and nuts and washers, and the U-bolt. So, time to assemble. And here's the completed antenna. Came together very nicely. Got all of the directors there. And then the folded dipole mounted here. Got the ballon and the U-bolt for the mast. Now, one thing if I had to do it over that I would do differently I don't like how close together the feed point is I didn't realize on my design that it would be that close together so if I had to do it again I would spread them a little bit further apart but they're not touching so it should be fine and the antenna should perform pretty much as the model suggests it should because of the easy design here I was basically able to construct it to within one millimeter of the design tolerances. So it's very accurate in design and construction. Um, so these, these plastic blocks here, they've, there's a little bit of epoxy there to hold them in place, plus the screws through into the boom have thread locker on them. So they're not going to come loose. So yeah, there's the Finished Yogi. Next step is mount it up on the roof and see what kind of reception we get. Now that the antenna is complete, the big question is how does it actually work? So I decided to compare the Yogi against my Channel Master 4221, which is a four bay antenna. Now it's kind of an unfair comparison because the Channel Master is designed for a wide range of channels, pretty much all the UHF channels whereas the Yagi I designed was for one specific channel being 19. But, you know, we'll run the comparison. I basically mounted each antenna in the exact same location and then scanned for channels with my TV, wrote down the average signal strength for each channel that the TV reported. My particular TV records two different numbers. First is the signal strength, which is in percentage, and then the second one is a signal-to-noise ratio in decibels, and for both numbers, higher is better. So for the first channel, channel 15, uh, you can see both did very well. Um, both got 98%, uh, slightly higher uh, signal to noise ratio on the channel master. So a slight win there, but um, for channel 16, um, you can see they both got the same percentage, although the Yagi had slightly higher um, signal to noise ratio. And I'm guessing it's because we're getting close to um, what this channel is designed for, so there's going to be a peak on that channel. At channel 19 itself, um, the channel master at 56% is very low. The TV could not lock onto it. Um, the Yagi, it could actually lock onto at 62%, so it's a little bit better. Um, that said, that's still far lower than I was expecting, but after I finish the rundown here, I'll, I'll talk about why it's so low and what could be done to fix it. 
Uh, for channel 24, again, the Yagi outperformed the channel master, not that far off of the design channel 19, so kind of expected. Uh, channel 31, here's where you can see it starts to drop off again, and the channel master is outperforming 84% to 76. At channel 34, so, you know, channel master is still higher. And channel 41, um, oddly enough, they both picked it up at the exact same level. And then lastly at channel 50, you can see definitely the, the Yagi is dropping off quickly, but the uh, channel master is still doing very well. Now, I mentioned earlier that even though this was designed for channel 19, I was very underwhelmed by the performance, I guess you could say, and I think it has to do with the mounting location. Um, so if you're looking overhead, so if I basically, you know, if you got kind of north here, the, the signal I'm trying to receive is coming in from this direction. And now the problem with where I mounted the antenna is about a foot and a half this direction, there's a building right here. Basically my house is right there. And so the, the Yagi was right here, literally pointed at the building. And so there's no way for signal to, or well, the signal will go through the structure, but you'll get far better signal if you, if I were to mount the antenna out here where it would clear the building, then it would definitely get higher performance. And I never actually got around to moving the mast and trying the antenna over here. If I were to use this antenna long term, that's what I would do. But um, that said, things have changed in my area and it turns out this antenna is no longer necessary. Um, I designed this antenna in early December, got the materials for it, built it, and then tested it. It took about a month or so of working and what little free time I have here and there from design to actual completion and testing. And during that one month period, they've changed the channels in my area. So, you know, if I'm located here in my particular area, there's a bunch of channels all located up here, except for the one channel that I was trying to get, which is located off here. It's much further, much weaker. So that's why I was going to have a dedicated Yagi just for that one and then have a second antenna for all these signals. Well, in that one month period, this TV station put a low power repeater of their signal up here. So it's actually irrelevant. I don't need to try and get this anymore. I can just use one antenna pointed up here to get everything I want. So yeah, that's why I'm not even going to bother trying to test the antenna out here because I just don't need it anymore. Um, I was, it was still fun to build. It was uh, an interesting project and it does work, but I just don't need it anymore. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that.